This is a flying computer built in vanilla Minecraft. Now, computers have been built for a while, flying machines have been built for a while, but this is the first proof of concept that any computation you could ever need to do can be put on a flying machine in the game, or at least a two-way flying machine. I think these are super flippin' cool, so I want to go through it, explain the different parts and how it works, and I want to try something different. So, because it's a nice day out, and because, honestly, it's also more fun, and because this thing's kind of messy and cluttered, I did my best to color code it. I think it'll be better if we take a walk, so let's go down to the park, and we'll do our best to understand how Turing machines work. Turing machines, they're really basic computers. They have three parts, which is kind of like program, memory, and a CPU. I'm pretending to be the CPU. This book is my program, and the coins on the sidewalk on the ground are like the memory. Each sidewalk square is like a bit in memory, and then, you know, the coin heads up is like a one, and the, you know, tails up is like a zero. You know those books you read as a kid where, like, they gave you choices, and you could turn to different pages depending on which choice you, you took? Like, if you, you know, the page reads like, you walk into a cave, you hear a weird noise. If you choose to explore, turn to page 5. If you run out of the cave, turn to page 13, or something like that. Turing Machine's instructions books are a lot like that. Here we have my first page in my program. Can you read it okay? Page 1. It gives me different instructions depending on whether or not there's tails or heads. So it's kind of like you know, those books where you can turn to different pages, but all the choices are already made for you by the coins and how you flip them. So, okay, I'm on page one, and I have a heads up right now, and the instructions for heads is to move to the left, and then turn to page two. Then I do that, and here we got another heads. So then we, my instructions now on page two are to flip the coin, move left, and turn to page three. So that is exactly what I do. And then you keep doing this on and on and on, and, well, one of the big questions about Turing machines and why they're so important is the problem of trying to decide if they ever finish their book, if they get to the end of the story, or if they just keep turning through pages in an endless loop forever. And, well, my book does have a stop, so if I get a Tails when I'm on page three, I flip the coin and then I'm done. I finish the plot, the book is over, I'm good. Is there anything else I need to talk about? Like, what does that make sense for how a Turing machine works? Mm, yeah. What are they used for? Uh, for the most part today, no one builds them unless it's like for fun. What's, what they're used for is theory. So it turns out, and the reason Turing machines are so important is it, people figured out, and this is who they're named for, is Alan Turing um, figured a lot of this out, is that any computer, any program it ever runs, you can come up with an instruction book just like this that will perform the exact same computation as that computer. It doesn't matter if you got your 370 RTX fancy graphics card, it doesn't matter if you got your 10th gen CPU, everything you can currently buy for a computer does the exact same stuff just a lot faster and more efficiently than a Turing machine. But because Turing machines are so much easier to get your mind around, they're used for a lot of proofs about what computers can and can't solve, what their limits are. <laughs> I'll use that as like the cut to the... I wanted to demonstrate like the instruction book metaphor and me actually jumping around side to side with the quarters because this machine, however messy it looks, is doing the exact same thing. Get my face in a smaller square so y'all can see more of it. This line of wall blocks down here, these are the quarters, or the sidewalk squares, and if a wall block gets pulled upwards, that's like having a coin that's heads up, and if this wall block is down, that's like having a tail up coin. You can see the default is to have uh, tails coins, and then the machine will flip some to heads and do all its computation and whatever. The first thing we have here is the heads-tails uh, split reader. So if it's a heads, a pulse is sent to this circuit up here, and if it's a tails, a pulse is sent to the circuit down here. 
Now we have uh, four pistons here on this red circuit, and this these are what actually control what page in the instruction book the machine is open to. So we have page one, two, three, four, and then same thing, page one, two, three, and four. So right now, the machine is on page one. And then we have the same thing here. We have to have it in two places uh, because we have two uh, separate program memories, one for what the machine does when it reads tails and one for what it does when it reads the heads. See, so actually, it just uh, turn from page one to page two. And down here, we have a big array of pistons and wall blocks, and these are actually what control which actions it performs on which pages for which coin it reads. And then we have the same thing mirrored up here. And this is the set of actions it performs when it reads uh, an up wool block on the tape, or when it finds a coin that's heads up. And then all the pistons and wool blocks here control which actions it performs when it finds a coin that's tails up. Then both of these, uh, so red circuit splits the output of the memory tape into either heads actions or tails actions. Green circuit here is the programming, which controls uh, what actions follow from reading a heads-up coin or a tails coin. And then next we have seven wires, because there's seven different things this machine can do. So on the front, you can see that there's kind of seven different segments here, and each one of those is a wire controlling a possible action that the Turing machine can take. So the first four just control which page of its instruction book it's open to. So. If a pulse gets sent down the first wire, then it'll turn to page one. If a pulse gets sent down the second wire, it'll turn to page two. It's a little bit weirder than that because you also have to send it a message to close a page of the book. Otherwise, you can accidentally have two pages open at once and weird stuff can happen. But the interesting stuff here is the last three wires. So we have this one, this one, and this one. This wire here is what controls flipping the coin on the ground. So if you see a pulse come through this wire, by the way, you might notice that all the wires are like jittering a lot, and that's because I couldn't figure out a way to move wires on a two-way flying machine easily without them jittering. There's ways around it. I have another video that explains like all about two-way flying machine wiring. So if the program uh, inside, you know, reads ahead, sends a pulse down the fifth wire, that pulse will travel down this yellow circuit all the way back over to the memory tape here and will flip the bit on the tape. Just like that. Lastly, the sixth and seventh wire control how this machine actually moves left and right. So we have this circuit here. It's actually one of the harder pieces to make for this thing. But this piston will move the machine to the left, and this piston will move it to the right. So it is like kind of flip. The left piston moves it to the right, the right piston moves it to the left. It was just the easiest way to put it together. And that's how movement and flipping the coin work. And then for turning to a different page, these orange wires bring the, the pulse traveling down the wire from the main data bus, is we could call it, so the wires that come out of the, the program uh, instructions in here, and bring those pulses up over the machine to the left, down the side here, where they can actually turn to different pages. So that's what's going on right down here. So the position of the pistons here represent the pages, and the sticky pistons beneath them can turn different pages open and closed, controlling um, which page the machine's on. And then lastly, because the wire's all jittering, a lot of these parts we actually have to move after a long delay. So there's actually huge room to make this thing faster. But the purple circuit here and the purple circuit up here, all they do is they add delay when the machine moves so that it doesn't accidentally try to move pistons in the wiring while they're extended. And all that put together gives you a fully functional Turing machine in the game. Now, this particular Turing machine, it can't do any and every computation you would want, because this has four states in it. But 
every part of this is tileable. So if you wanted five, six, seven, twenty pages in your instruction book on this thing, you could take those four orange lines and just extend them out a lot further, but the same pattern. Just copy and paste. And then same thing over here. You just copy and paste these wires out, and you need a little bit more delay because you know now the size of this thing is scaling with the square of the number of pages you have in your book. But it's a proof of concept. And it works, which is like super crazy. It did break badly a lot of times and took a lot of time to fix up. But seeing the thing working is super cool. The program it's running right now is actually the same one I had in my little notebook and the one that you saw me hopping around for. For It, it looked like 30 seconds, but I was actually out there jumping around in the heat for like a solid 25 minutes. And it's called the Busy Beaver program. So the challenge is, if I give you an instruction book with four pages for a Turing machine, and you can write, you know, flip coin, move left, move right, turn the page, whatever. How many coins can you get that Turing machine to flip to heads before it stops? And it has to stop, so you're not allowed to just be like, oh, flip coin to heads, move left, flip coin to heads, move left, flip, and then keep going. It has to stop eventually, and that's called the Busy Beaver problem. And this machine is is doing the same thing right now. This this thing takes like 40 something minutes to get through the program, so I guess I'm slightly faster than the Minecraft Turing machine. If you do open up the world to screw around this thing, uh, just be warned that it's a little glitchy and does sometimes leave ghost blocks behind. But the machine runs fine regardless of them. So if you want to stop the machine, you can just remove the blocks from the memory tape where it's at, and then when it tries to read the memory tape, it doesn't read anything, so it doesn't do anything. Now, if you want to toy around with this, there'll be a download in the description, and what we'll do now is we're going to program it. Just do something simple. We're just going to have it move off endlessly to the right and leave a zigzag pattern in the blocks as it moves. So first, let's see what page it's turned to. Turn to page two, so let's just start it on page one to make it easy. So I place this here, quick. Yep, that'll turn, that'll close page two. You have to close and open each page individually. Now let's open to page one. Perfect. Okay, so when we read Tales on page one, we want to close page one, open page two, flip the coin, and move to the right. Let's see if we can do all that. This is Tails on page one. Okay, yep, so we already have closed page one. Turn to page two. Do not also turn to page three and four. And here we have flip the coin. And this is move right. So, oh, it's correct already. Easy for us. Now, page two is going to have to be a little different. Let's go in here. It reads the tails on page two. And now we want it to turn back to page one. Yep. And we want it not to flip the coin. And to move right again. Right now, it's set up to move left. So, remember, weird setup. Left piston moves it to the right, right piston moves it to the left. And there we go. That should produce a zigzag pattern. So to start it up, we can uh, send a quick pulse in here. The way I do this is I just place and remove a block super fast. There we go. It's probably a better way to do that. And now the machine's up and running. So let's see if we get what we want. So should move right. Okay, first block is picked up. Make sure it's still on page one or two. Okay, yeah. So I built this thing, you know, with the memory tape, like out in an endless line in front of it, make it easy on the machine. But what you could do, and what people have already done, is put memory tapes on flying machines. 
So what you could do is, you know, you could get a big flying machine, bunch of states, bunch of uh, long memory lines inside, and you could program it to do some like, you know, you could put a sensor that detects when it hits a wall or something, and you could program a flying machine to fly off, hit a wall, and then fly back to where it started while launching like TNT missiles after moving a prime number of blocks for each prime number or something like that. Like, that's some crazy arbitrary idea, but that's possible. It'd just be this, but bigger and slower. Well, thanks for watching, y'all. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. And by the way, doing a Turing machine's job is a lot of work, man. Like, I don't know if you saw that, but that was like a hundred burpees that I just did. Oh like, yeah, it is. If, if you want some intense smarty pants workout, simulating a Turing machine is a, is a pretty good choice.